We are in a series on, it's the biography. Usually I do, I'll do, a, uh, some, I do a series on this, a biography on an individual, or I'll do a series on a book of the Bible, or I'll do a series on a topic. And so right now we're in a biography. It's a strange biography. I'm doing two biographies all at once. It is basically the biography of Israel. Israel, the man, and Israel, the nation. So we're learning a little bit about who the man Israel is in the Bible, and not equally important, but importantly, uh, why the nation Israel. And uh, when, when the attack, the Hamas attack happened in October, we're now 15 Sabbaths from that attack. And so when, it, when it took place, it was just really heavy on my heart that we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem every Sunday, that as the church, as the body of Christ, we are, we're following, you know, the biblical mandate to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So um, I figured I can't really ask you to pray for the peace of Israel if you don't know much about it, or if you don't know what's going on, or how it all started. So, um, so we're just kind of digging into a little bit of history, learning why there is such a conflict in the Middle East and why I'm asking you to pray, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So this is, um, there's some bad blood. If you follow the news, you know that there is some bad blood between Israel, the Palestinians, and specifically the Arab nations. And where does this bad blood come from? Why, why is there so much tension in the Middle East? You know, if if things continue the way that they're going, it could be a, it could end our world as we know it. I mean, I don't want to breed fear or anything, but that's just the truth. Like, you know, the end of the world is going to take place right there, and there are so many strange things going on. We all need to be waking up a little bit to the reality of what's taking place in our world. And so, uh, why Israel? Why, why the Jewish people? And what is this beef with the Arab people? And where does it, where does it come from? Now, if you were with us last week, I kind of gave uh, the introduction of the birth of the, of the modern nation of Israel. So how it came to be. Uh, because it just, you know, 1952 is like when the birth of the modern nation of Israel took place. And so logically, we could understand why the birth of a brand new nation where immigrants from all over the world are returning to their promised land, where there would be inevitable displacement of other people. Like this is, it is our human nature to, to move around. It is our, it is within our, I don't know, I don't know, it's just, it was just our human uh, tendency to migrate. This is what we do. Um, California is a migration state, and it's constantly changing. And uh, it's kind of hard to get your head around how rapidly this state has changed. So the same thing happened in Israel. Israel, in many ways, is much like California. It's beautiful. The sun is always shining. The food is great. It feels like home when you're there. So if you're a Californian and you want to visit Israel, it feels like home, in my opinion. But when they started that nation, there was huge conflict. They had enemies on every side. America was the very first uh, country to recognize Israel as a nation. UN followed with some other major world powers. Uh, every Arab nation does not recognize, not everyone, but most of them, uh, 13 Arab nations do not recognize Israel as a legitimate entity, which is a big problem. So uh, we can understand why there's a beef because there was massive people movement, massive change, and something new came out of nothing. And, well, people fight over stuff like that. But there is a much deeper beef. There is a spiritual war that has been taking place between these people groups that, that's biblical, that is literally 
biblical, and it goes all the way back to the very foundation of who the Jewish people are. Who is the father of the faith? Abraham. You guys went to Sunday school. Good job. Abraham. Father Abraham. He is such a fascinating and in in many ways mysterious character. And he knew that God was going to bless the world through his offspring. Like he heard this call, he heard this voice of God, and this incredible blessing was going to come through his seed. A blessing that was going to stomp on the head of Satan. Now, it almost seems like Abraham was an American because he has the patience of a toddler. (laughs) Like, he knows that God's going to bless him, but he's like, you know, he's like you and me. Come on, God, you gave me the promise five minutes ago. Where's my blessing? When is this thing going to get going? Come on, Lord. We've got a fast food culture. We want our blessing. We want it now. And it, was just, it wasn't coming. Now, whenever I know that God has got a promise for me or my family, I'm like you. I, 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 have, a, I have a fast food culture. I have a consumer mentality. And I, and I think if God doesn't move fast enough, then he, maybe he doesn't love me or something like that, right? Abraham was the same way. You know, God's, Abraham's like, gosh, this is taken forever. And my wife is getting old and she's not pregnant. You know the story. Again, you went to Sunday school. And so this is what Abraham does. And this is what we do. Abraham decides that he's going to help God out. God, I know that you don't have the ability to pull this off. So let me, let me help you out. And I'm going to I'm going to pull this off. I'm going to help. I'm going to, we're going to speed up the process of this blessing through my lineage. And, uh, and well, Sarah gets put in another tent and he uh, lays with his, her maidservant, Hagar, and they birth an Ishmael. Birthing an Ishmael means that you can't wait on God, and you have a, you're going to help God out. And so this is what literally Abraham is doing, and he births an Ishmael to help God out. And the only problem was is that God wasn't in it. It was inside of Abraham's own will and drive and power and not God's. And we have a tendency to do this as Christians, as believers, when we don't think God is moving fast enough for us, we will birth Ishmaels in our lives. And whenever we do birth an Ishmael, whenever we decide to help God out and we create something that did not exist before, we create a mess. We create the tendency for there to be pain and heartache because we have pushed our will outside of God's will into into something that's going to make us struggle, something that's going to be difficult. And so Ishmael is born via Haggai, and it's a really sad situation. It's a really heartbreaking situation, and they get kicked out into the desert. But that promise, that heritage of a multitude coming from Abraham's seed gets passed on to Hagar and Ishmael. And Ishmael's descendants are the Arab people. Isn't that a a strange thought to think about? That the people that are... I know I have to be careful how I say this kind of stuff, huh? The tension in the Middle East between the Jews and the Arabs, they're quite literally a tension between two ancient brothers because they're both the children of Abraham. And they, they, there is like this spiritual dynamic in both people groups that has the ability to change the world. We, I, I showed you last week, in the last few weeks, how the Jewish people are a blessing to the world. They are changing the world uh, for the better, if you will. I mean, they, we've got Steven Spielberg, you know, I mean, it's like, 
we've got some great movies. So we've been blessed by some great entertainment, among other things. So there, you, can, you can see God's handiwork all over the Jewish people on what, how much they've been a blessing to the world. What about the descendants of Ishmael? Are they a blessing? Uh, that was a, that's a different type of a question. I don't have time to get into that. But what we do know is the descendants of Ishmael have greatly impacted the world. It's the number one growing religion in the world is Islam. They are the descendants of Abraham. I believe that they got their scriptures wrong. I'm not saying that there's not good stuff in the Quran, but there's, some, there's definitely some stuff that is disturbing in the Quran. And I'm, you know, they, well, it depends on how you interpret it, I guess. But if I read it straight, I don't like what it says. So this bad beef, and then there's a huge spiritual dynamic that, that generates world changers. World changers. Islam spread from this little podunk town in the middle of the desert in 700 AD, and within a few hundred years, they are in Europe, they are in Persia, they are in Indonesia, they are all over the world, they're here. It, it's, and they have a mandate. Their mandate is to, to literally take over the world. It's in their spiritual DNA. And so we see a huge conflict between an ancient feud. This, this fight is nothing new. This is an ancient fight. This is, this is an ancient tension. This is a family feud. You know, probably in heaven, there's like this big giant family feud game board thing. And um, they're up there fighting. Who knows? And despite all of our intentions to build political peace accords, nothing is going to heal that divide with the exception of Jesus Christ. Amen. There, is, there is no deal signing. There is no, you know, da the, the David Accords was a great idea, but it's, it's burning, you know, it's not working right now. Like, nothing is going to reconcile those two ancient brothers without the reconciliation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And it can be done. So, no matter what your, what your view of Islamic people are, you know, whether you see that, I think it's actually, frankly, I think it's a great and, and fun culture. Again, there's certain things in the scriptures I just I can't agree with. I, I, I love the vitality of the people. I love their, their dedication to moral values. I love their dedication to prayer. Do you know who, you know what um, Islamic men are known for? Prayer. What are Christian men known for? Super Bowl parties. I mean, it's, I mean, really, like, like that, they, they just, they have a dedication, and again, I think it's, I think it's skewed, I think they're, they're wrong, but I, I love their heart for, for God, even though their, their interpretation of God is wrong. I think they're deceived. But the, the Muslims that get, and this is happening at, at a rapid pace right now, the Muslims that get exposed to Jesus, to Yeshua, it's radical, and it's powerful, and they experience the love of God, and they give their lives over in radical ways, in good ways. So I believe that God wants to reconcile those two uh, fighting families, and Jesus is the reconciler. Amen. Both Jews and Muslims need to come to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Woo, you guys Okay. <laughs> I'm like kicking the horn's nets this morning, aren't I? All right, now, in our story of Jacob, so Abraham has Isaac, and I, last week I told you who Isaac was, and Isaac has Jacob and Esau. If you weren't here last week, watch the video. Jacob and Esau 
are once again our two brothers. They're twins. But only one is going to receive this Abrahamic blessing covenant that from that seed will bless the entire world. Only one of the sons gets it. And for whatever reason, we can, we'll look into it a little bit, but whatever reason, the younger son is chosen. And we talked about the very name of Jacob last week. His, his name literally translates into usurper or the sneaky one or the liar, the heel catcher. He's trying to steal his brother's inheritance, his blessing. Right out of the, right out of the, the womb, there's struggle between these two brothers. Mark, do you ever wrestle with your brother? Yeah. yeah. But you can take him, right? <laughs> you better believe it. Um, so there's there's always not there's not always, but you know siblings are siblings, and 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 brothers wrestle, and, and that's a that's a good thing. And and I, I like I said, I, I'm I'm a grown man, and I'll still argue with my sister in the back seat of the car. We're both grown women. I'm not a grown woman. I <laughs> know. Whoa. All right, better have some more of this. She's a grown woman. I'm a grown man. I'm a big boy. And uh, so there is this huge tension, and there's a false identity in who Jacob is. His entire life, he's, a, he's had to live up to his name, which is the usurper of the blessing. The liar. And last week, I showed you how God took an individual who had major character flaws and took that broken person and literally changed his name. Changed his name from usurper to what? Israel. The one who strives, the one who wrestles with God. And this is, the, this is the literal definition of the individual's name, Israel, and the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel literally translates into the people that strive with God or the people that wrestle with God. And I believe that that name applies to us, too, as individuals. We've got to get down and dirty with God. We've got to get in the dirt, and we've got to wrestle our stuff out with Him. I did make a distinction last week that even though we're wrestling with God, it is not a good idea to choose God off and fight with God. Fighting with God means that you are blaming God for all of your problems, that you are projecting an, an, an evil lens upon a good and heavenly Father. But wrestling with God says, I'm bringing you my issues. I'm bringing you my hurts. I'm bringing you my pain. And we're gonna, we're gonna, I want to wrestle it out. And we're going to go through it all night long until you bless me. So that, that, that part right there. I'm going to wrestle until you give me your blessing. That, right, that part right there, the blessing part, is the indication that we are wrestling with God and not fighting with God. If you're fighting with God, you will not be asking for a blessing at the end. If you're fighting with God, then you're just cursing God. Does that, do, you see this, do you see the difference? If you're wrestling with God, you're wrestling to get the blessing. So let's wrestle for that blessing. All right. Now, Jacob has to flee his homeland because he's stolen his brother's inheritance. His brother, rightfully so, is hopping mad. And he wants to murder him. He's going to kill him. He's, he's actually put a hit out on his own brother. He literally says, uh, and I forgot what chapter it was. He literally says in the story, when dad dies, you die. Isn't that it's kind of cool, huh? As soon as, dad, as soon as dad closes his eyes, I'm coming for you, Jacob, and I'm going to kill you. This is good stuff. This should make a movie about it. 
And so Jacob runs, and in, in this running, and in, in this fleeing from the promised land into other areas, God begins to work on him, begins to wrestle with him before they have the wrestling match. He has an open vision of heaven, the stairway to heaven, which we talked about last week. He sees into the heavenly realms, and he sees God up at the top of the, of the stairs, if you will. And he sees the angels ascending and descending upon the place, and it becomes a holy and sacred place. A very powerful, defining moment. Before the stairway to heaven, uh, there's no record of Jacob talking to God. He has an encounter with God. He has a revelation of God that leads him into a new destiny. I asked you all last week, have you, have you had a revelation of God? Uh, and if you want a revelation, raise your hand. Nobody raised their hands. At least I didn't see any. So all of you, I'm assuming, God has revealed himself to you, hopefully in a powerful way. Like, I want your revelation to be one of a stairway to heaven. But if you don't get that, you have another revelation, and it's called the good book. God has already revealed himself to you, either in scripture, either in nature, or either in a supernatural encounter. If you're like bummed because you got the revelation of God through the book, which is great, it's good enough, by the way, but you want a power encounter, you want a God experience, you want a religious experience, just keep on praying. He's, he, he's there. And he'll lead you into that. Jacob has a religious experience. Jacob has to do some time with Uncle Laban. There's speculation with some scholars that Laban actually held him captive like a slave. Laban um, marries off two daughters and two concubines to Jacob. And everything that Jacob puts his hands to, it gets blessed and multiplied. Minus is, I mean, he's got major, major problems with his two wives. Uh, Leah has six kids, and Rachel has a couple of kids, and the concubines have some kids. It all numbers 12, uh, eventually 13. They, they, have, they have 11 boys, and they have one girl, and they're going to have another one. Rachel's going to have another kid. Now is the time that he is going to go back into his promised land, into his inheritance, into a conflict, a blood feud with his brother. And before he enters into the promised land, before he enters into this conflict with his brother, what did he do last week? He wrestled all night long with God. Remember this part? So he has an encounter, his revelation, uh, and then he wrestles with God, and in this wrestling with God, his name gets changed, his hip gets touched, and it's dislocated, and now he's walking with a limp. And this is where we're gonna this is where we're gonna pick up the story. So get your Bibles out. We're on Genesis chapter thirty three, verse one. And then if you want to bookmark the next verse we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Genesis 33. Then Jacob looked up and he saw Esau coming with 400 men. Last time they talked, Esau's like, I'm going to kill you. All right? So how do you think Jacob's feeling right now? He's a little nervous. He's in a, it's a dark night of the soul. That's why he has to wrestle with God, because he thinks that his brother is going to kill him. And right, again, rightfully so. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids and their children in front, and Leah and her children after them, and Rachel and Joseph the last. Do you know why he does this? Because this is the order and who he likes best. I know, it's just, 
So the maid servants go first with their kids, and then Leah, who he just doesn't think is that pretty, but she has the majority of the kids. And Rachel, the one that he loves, only has one kid. He leaves her back, so, you know, because he loves her the most. It's just, it's just messed up. It's really, it's just so messed up. It's such a messed up story. Then Jacob crossed over the stream ahead of them, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times, bowing and moving forward each time. So Jacob is basically, he's shaking in his boots. He crosses the stream into Esau's land, and he's bowing, and he's shaking, and he's moving slowly forward, just trying to anticipate what Esau's move is going to be. There's so much tension in this scene. Verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him. And he hugged his neck and he kissed him. And they wept for joy. It's, not a, it's, it's exactly not the response that he was expecting. Esau looked up and he saw the women and the children and he said, who are these with you? And so Jacob replied, they are the children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids approached with their children and they bowed down. Leah also approached with her children and they bowed down. Afterwards, Joseph and Rachel approached and they bowed down. Esau asked, What do you mean by all of this company which I have met? He, and he answered, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And so Jacob replied, No, please. If now I have found favor in your sight, then accept my gifts as a blessing from my, heart, from my hard hand to work. For I see your face as if you have seen the face of God, and you have received me favorably. Okay, so like almost in this, in this moment of reconciliation, Jacob is having another God encounter through forgiveness. Please accept my blessing gift, which has been brought to you. For God has dealt graciously with me, and I have everything that I have that I could possibly want. And so Jacob kept urging him and Esau to accept, to urging Esau to accept it. Okay, now, verse 12. Then Esau said, let us get up. And he started on our journey, and I will go in front of you to lead the way. And so he saw this, he's inviting Jacob into the family. He says, well, okay, it's time to go. Let's go start our new life together. I'm going to lead the way. You already said that, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to give me all of this stuff that God's blessed you with. Come on, let me, let me lead the way. Let's go start off this new blessing together. But Jacob replied, you know, my Lord, that the children are frail and need gentle care, and the nursing flocks and the herds with the young are of concern to me. For if the men should drive them hard for a single day, all the flocks will die. Please let my Lord go ahead of the servants, and I will move uh, on slowly, governed by the pace of the livestock that are in front of me and according to the endurance of the children until I come back to my Lord in Seir in Edom. Then Esau said, Please let me leave with you some of my people who are with me. But Jacob said, What need is there of that? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. And so Esau turned back toward the south that day on his way to Seir. Can okay, I pay attention? But Jacob journeyed north to Sukkot and built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock 
So the name of the place becomes Sukkot, huts and shelters. All right, what is going on in this story? All right, again, the previous night, Jacob is wrestling with God all night long. Literally, the angel of God, Jesus, he is wrestling with Jesus all night long. And such a powerful thing takes place that God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And then again, touches his hip, and he is now limping. This moment between Esau and Jacob meeting on the other side of the river, like, like the tension is so thick. You, you just don't know like, what's going to take place. I don't even believe that Esau knew what he was going to do. Esau shows up with 400 men. Esau is dealing with hurt and betrayal and bitterness of his brothers. And, you know, again, he's this hairy guy. He's a, he's a man's man. He's an adventurer. He's, he's always out in the woods. So he's had a lot of time to stew. He's had a lot of time to think about it. I don't necessarily see Esau as being the most forgiving of men. I don't even think he knew what he was going to do in the moment. He was probably flip-flopping back and forth. Do I murder my brother? That would be lots of fun. I would get fulfilled if I murdered my brother. Or maybe I do something else. Now, as Jacob is approaching kneeling and bowing and inching forward and inching forward. Do you know how he's walking? Is he strutting in? Is he, uh, is he walking with his shoulders back and is he, is he you know, carrying a big stick? Is he walking into a confrontation that he might have to fight in? How does he approach? He, he approaches humbly. He is, he is step by step, bowing, kneeling, bowing, kneeling, you know, moving a little bit forward in, a little bit forward in. But most importantly, his whole time walking forward into this confrontation, he is limping. Why? It's because he has been touched by God. So this is this is my conjecture. This is what I think that's taking place, is that Esau sees that his brother Jacob is approaching this confrontation, and he's approaching with a limp. I'm, I'm reading my own thing into this, but this is what I think that Esau's thinking. I, I think that he's thinking, well, I could kill my brother right now, but the thing is, my brother has been walking with God. I believe that that's what Esau saw. Because remember, they're twins. Remember, there is a spiritual inheritance inside of Esau. Like something is going to come out of him in his life. And so I believe that he sees Jacob and he recognizes somebody that has been walking with God. And he's attracted to this person that walks with God. He's attracted to somebody that walks with the limp. I'm not quite sure who said it. I think it was John Wimber, but... John Wimber said, and he's probably ripping somebody else off, but John Wimber once said that you never trust anybody that doesn't walk with a limp. The perfect cookie-cutter Christian that has all the answers, that says that they're right and that they have everything all figured out, That's the person you don't trust. <laughs> Somebody that, that walks humbly with the Lord, that, that walks with the limp. And I'm not saying that they just, uh, you know, they have to expose all of their hurt and pain for you. I'm like, we don't want wants to hang out with people like that. But there needs, <laughs> there needs to be an authenticity. Like, you're, you're just not covering stuff up. Like, like this is who I am. This is, this is what I've, you know, I... I God and I have struggled together, and we've walked together, and, and life is hard, and I'm limping. Like, these are the people that you want to follow. There's so much criticism right now towards the American church 
because of uh, celebrity rock star pastors. We have good reason to be cynical. We've, m- we've made an embarrassing mess out of the bride of Christ. Some of you young folk, I won't be your last pastor. You're, you're going to, you know, some, and a lot of people are moving these days. Like I said, we're a transitory people. Everybody's moving to Texas. Everybody's moving to Tennessee. The weird ones are moving to Idaho. <laughs> Terrible ideas, by the way. I, I, I tell this to our high school kids that always, you know, venture out. They come out from underneath their parents' spiritual covering, and they begin to forge their own spiritual journey. Like when you're looking for a church, when you're looking for a senior pastor, make sure that their ego and their pride is, is not the thing that draws people into the church. Never follow an individual that motivates with power trips and manipulation. You need to follow people that will motivate and lead from, from the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, gentleness, and everybody's favorite, self-control. You need, you need to follow leaders that, that can practice the spiritual gift of spiritual fruit of self-control. And so Jacob is modeling to us a godly man that walks openly into conflict with a limp. And, and we need to do this. Again, you shouldn't like put all of your baggage up you know, on your sleeve. Does that make sense? Wearing your baggage on your sleeve. You wear your hearts on your sleeve, right? And then you, you carry your baggage in your trunk. I don't know. It, 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 the, the, the spiritual life or the, 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 the discipled person, uh, whenever you're di- discipling somebody, you don't say, here's all my problems. Like, don't do that. But you do need to be honest with the things that you've struggled with and the limps that you've, that you've walked with. And you need to be able to share and shepherd other people with your limps. And he's like, look, I, I, there was a time I didn't want to walk. But now I walk. I just walk with a limp. God has slowed me down. Some of you have learned how to, to walk with a scooter. Huh, honey? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Because sometimes the Lord needs to slow you down. <laughs> I know. I'm in big trouble right now. Yeah, a big, I'm going to get run over now. All right. So I, this is what I believe. I believe that, that that incident didn't turn out in violence because Esau recognized that Jacob was walking with God. And the only way that you can recognize if somebody is walking with God is if they are limping. Yeah? So do you walk with a limp? Or maybe you're crawling? Or maybe you're faking it? No, I'm walking just fine. I'm not limping at all. But you're like, it's hurting really, really bad inside. Yeah? Walk humbly with the Lord and walk with that limp. Now, the name Israel, those that struggle and strive and wrestle with God. Today's message is entitled, Those That Limp With God. And as believers, I believe that we need to limp with God. And I also believe that God's chosen people not only need to step into their namesake, but they also need to step into their founder's example of walking with the limp. More on that. All right. The scenario of Jacob now talking to his brother, and it is 
a beautiful scene, right? There's like this visual of, of Esau running up to Jacob. And Jacob's probably like, oh man, he's going to pop me, right? And instead of getting hit and punched in the face, he gets embraced. What a beautiful image of reconciliation. That is what this story is about. This story is about the reconciliation of two brothers that have a huge blood feud. And this, this embrace is so gentle and is so kind. And it is so transformative. Like, he, again, he's had, Jacob's had some really empower, had some powerful encounters with God up to this point. But this is probably the most powerful encounter that he's had with God because it deals with the heart of God, which is forgiveness and reconciliation. Isn't this cool? In the Gospel of Luke... Jesus begins to tell a story. He tells the story of the prodigal son. So turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Verse 11. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. How many sons did Isaac have? Two. The younger of them inappropriately said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. And so he divided the estate between them. And a few days later, the younger son gathered together everything that he had had, and he traveled to a distant country. Does this sound familiar? And there he wasted his fortune in, in reckless and immoral living. He went to Las Vegas. <laughs> okay. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in the country, and he began to do without and to be in need. Does this sound familiar? And so he went and he forced himself on the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs, which is highly offensive because he's a good little Jew boy and Jews don't eat pigs or hang out with pigs because they're filthy animals. He would have had gladly eaten the, the, the pods that the pigs were eating, but they could not satisfy his hunger. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he finally came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough food while I'm here dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but just treat me like one of your hired men. And so he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with compassion, and he ran and he embraced and he kissed him. Does this sound familiar? And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly bring out the best robe for our honored guest. And you put it on him and give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet and bring out the fatted calf and slaughter it and let us invite everyone and feast and celebrate for this son of mine who was as good as dead and is now alive again. He was lost, but he has been found. And so they began to celebrate. Now, the older son was in the field, and when he returned, he approached the house, and he heard the music, and he heard the dancing, and so he summoned one of the servants, began asking what this celebration meant, and he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the elder brother became angry and deeply and deeply resentful, and was not willing to go in. He's throwing a temper tantrum outside. 
And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he said to his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never neglected or disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me so much as a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. He's in nor has he gotten some cheese with his wine. <laughs> but when his other son, when this other son of yours arrived, it's, it's kind of interesting. He calls him your son, not my brother. Yeah. He's gonna, it's an interesting little jab there. This son of yours arrived who has uh, devoured your estate with immoral women and has slaughtered the fattened calf. You have slaughtered the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have, all that, is, all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate. It's fitting to rejoice for this brother. So dad corrects him. It's your brother, not my son. For this brother of yours was as good as dead and has begun to live. He was lost, and now he is found. So when Jesus tells us the story, this is fascinating. Now, I know some of the characters don't all line up. He's telling the story of two brothers. He's telling the story of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of the power of forgiveness. And the way that Jesus tells the prodigal son story of the father sees the son off in the distance and he runs, and he embraces, and he kisses him. Jesus is using the same exact words, the same exact language that we see in the Jacob and Esau story. And so when Esau is running to embrace his brother, hugs him, and kisses him, like Jesus is almost literally quoting this scripture. Isn't that fascinating? Why is Jesus doing this? Why is he telling the story? We can all relate to the prodigal son story because you're all a bunch of prodigals. Like everybody can relate to the prodigal son story. You're either a prodigal son or you're a prodigal daughter. Um, everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of us have walked away from God. A lot of us have made huge mistakes. And so we can identify and we can relate to the story. Initially, not initially, but one way that we can interpret the prodigal uh, son story is that, well, we just think that Jesus, we can't apply it this way too, by the way. It's, it's okay to do this. There's multiple interpretations. There's multiple meanings of certain types of scriptures. This is one of them. But one way is that we interpret the prodigal son story is that we would see it as the older son is Israel, and you and me in the church of Jesus Christ, we are, we're the younger Son, we're the next ones that come along, and we squander and we waste our inheritance. This is again, this is one interpretation that we could say is that the, that we're the younger son, and and Jesus takes us in and he accepts us with all of our faults and he grafts us back in and then he calms down the older son, the Israel son, and and he, and he says like this is good. We need to celebrate. That's one interpretation. It's legitimate. Like it's one that that we all can relate to. I think. As Christians, we're not, we're not Israel. We're, we're, we're something different. The church is not the new Israel. It's, it's first sermon I did on this, I talked about the concept of replacement theology. We are not replacing Israel. We're not replacing God's people. We are the church. We're something different. But what Jesus is really saying to his audience. So again, we can interpret this way for us, but what Jesus is saying to his specific audience, what he is saying to the Sanhedrin, is he's talking to some, some super snobby religious critics. What he's saying to them in the prodigal son story, and when he quotes this story of Jacob and Esau, he is saying, look, Esau, if Esau can offer forgiveness and love and reconciliation. If somebody that is outside of that Abrahamic covenant blessing, because remember, Esau had the blessing stolen. He is not a, he's not a Jew. He had it stolen. 
if he can act like God, if he can, if he can act like Jesus, then, then we should too. If a pagan can offer love and forgiveness, then we should too. And this is what Jesus is highlighting. It's, just, it's absolutely fascinating. And so what Jesus is really saying and what I do applies, what I, I mean, again, we can take that one interpretation that we're the younger son, we've blown it, and God calls us back in, and then the older brother is going to have to be okay. But what, in reality, what the true translation, the true interpretation of this is that Israel is always the younger son. That Israel will be reconciled back to the father. This story is more about Israel than it is about you and me. Of course, we can lean, we can glean. Like, this is how we grow. This is how, we, this is how we're discipled. This is how we transform. But the story specifically is about God calling back his younger son. One of the interesting narratives throughout the entire scripture, it's always the younger son that, that, that God uses for some reason. For all of you firstborns, I'm sorry. But it's always the younger son. And the same story happens over and over again. That, they, that something bad happens and they get, they get called out of their land, either through war or famine or deceit. Like they get called out. And then they, got, and they come back in and God reconciles and restores the situation. Whether they get exiled to Babylon, they get exiled to Egypt, whether they get kicked out of their land uh, because of their own action, God always calls them back. So this story is about Israel being called back. Now, there was a really important nuance in the Jacob and Esau story that we just read that you need to catch. An incredible, powerful moment of reconciliation. One of the best in the Bible. Two families coming together to start a new destiny. Two twin brothers reconnected. All of the garbage put aside in a moment of a kiss. Did you catch what Jacob did? Esau says, Come. Let's go hang out. Let's start a new life together. Do you want to know what Jacob does? Did you guys catch it? Did you pay attention when, I, when we read the story? Do you, know what, do you know what Jacob does? Like immediately after this powerful moment of reconciliation, do you know what he does? He lies. He lies again. Immediately, he slips right back into his old nature. Did you guys catch when we were reading the story again? Remember, the night before, he wrestles with God all night long. And he doesn't let go of God until he gets the blessing, right? And then he gets the touch. And then we jump in the next day in the story. He crosses the stream. What, what name did we use in, in the scriptures for him? Did you guys catch that? They're calling him Jacob still. They don't, he's not using his new name. He's not using the name of Israel, one who wrestles with God. He wrestled with God all night long, and it's almost like he just forgot who he was. He defaulted back to his old, sinful, lying nature. Isn't that interesting? He allowed... Because the, the wrestling match with Jesus all night long, that's almost like a resurrection type of a moment. Like he's becoming a new person. He's like, like a rebirth, like a rededication. Like it's a baptism, if you will. He becomes a new person. And then immediately coming out of these, the, the darkness, because remember, you know, he went into a season of darkness. And from the moment that he left Israel, it's all dark. And the moment he comes out, uh, and comes back into Israel, the sun rises. It's like it's a brand new day. It's a brand new day. It's a brand new destiny. And yet we got the same old Jacob. He chose to resurrect his old self. 
if the choice would have been different, if he would have embraced the reconciliation in that moment, things would have been different, like drastically different. The very next chapter. So Jacob lies to his brother once again. His brother just goes off into the distance, uh, goes to Seir and Edom, starts the Edomite, Edomite clan. Interestingly enough, uh, Esau's, Esau marries one of his cousins, he marries an Ishmaelite. And so we have the merging of these two nations. And so Esau is connected, not directly, but he is connected to the, to, to the Muslim people. Interesting, isn't it? He goes his way. Jacob lies, heads the opposite direction of his family, sets up a new community. Now, this is... I think that this is important. I really do. He sets up a brand new community. He, uh, he starts off his blessing in the promised land with a lie, with deception, with his old nature once again. He sets it up. And the very next story is one of the saddest and most dramatic stories in the Bible. The very next story Jacob, Leah, Rachel, the two maidservants, and their 12 kids, 11 boys, one girl. They start hanging out with some unsavory people. And one of the darkest things in all of Scripture takes place. These unsavory people who they are now in community with, they rape Dinah, the daughter of Leah. It's tragic. It's horrible. We see Jacob's sons begin to act like Jacob and not act like Israel because they start their uh, career of lying too. They begin to lie. They begin to deceive. Um, they, plot, they plot their revenge, even though they just experienced an incredible reconciliation moment. They, they plot their revenge, and it is downright one of the most gangster stories you've ever heard. Like, they're supposed to be Jewish, but they're acting like they're the Italian mafia. They lie to, the, to these, these people, entire people group. They don't just go after the one offender. They, they lie to everybody. He says, well, well yeah, let's all, let's, let's all be one community. Here's the catch. You have to circumcise yourselves. I know. It's just a, it's, and then when they're, when they're all sore... The 11 tribes murder them all. What if, hypothetically, what if Jacob, at the moment of the reconciliation when his brother Esau embraces him, what if it wasn't Jacob, but it was his new man, Esau, or, or, or Israel? What if it wasn't Jacob? What if it was Israel? What if he, what if he embraced his new identity as one who wrestles with God. What would have happened if he would have chosen to be with his family? If he would have chosen that blessing over associating with people that were not good people? What horror could have been avoided if Jacob would have been Esau instead of Jacob in that moment? What would have happened if he said, you know what, in this instant, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to deceive, I'm going to just be honest, and I'm going to go with my brother. Uh, if, I, if I'm not going to go with my brother, I'm just going to tell my brother the honest truth. I mean, what would have happened if he would have came under the protection of his brother? Like that horrible instance would not have taken place. Fascinating, isn't it? So the tension, 
between Israel, the modern tension between Israel and the Palestinians and the Arab people all goes back to a family problem that took place in ancient times. I want to encourage us to be those that walk with a limp, that walk with God, that wrestle with God with a limp. Let's just say, all right, you know, these are our weaknesses, these are our faults, these are our character issues. Uh, we might slip back into our old nature, but we're going to move forward and we're going we're to identify with our new nature. We're going to become the new man, we're going to become the new woman. We take on that new identity in Christ, and there is power in the blessing, and we will be forgiven, and we will be received by a, a loving Heavenly Father that embraces us with a kiss, no matter how bad we've been. This weekend, we had a guest speaker, L.A. Marzuli. He's a, he's got an interesting ministry, but he's also a powerful man of God. I always love it when anointed men and women come and visit Granite Creek because they leave a little bit of their blessing with us. They, they impart onto us something that we didn't have before. And that definitely took place this week. And so I asked Mr. Marzulli to give us the benediction. So I have a little recording and we're going to play that now if you guys can. And we'll be free to go. All right, run it. Bring the lights down. Father, we just thank you for this church and, and the pastors and the people. And we just ask, Father, that your spirit would be here to lead and guide and that we would step aside and allow you to just fill your people with your blessings, your goodness, and your leading. Watch over this place, Lord. Watch over this place. Hedge it in. Protect it. Give it your special anointing, Lord. Angels. Let angels be around it. Father, we just thank you. And just pray a blessing over Pastor Josh and Nico. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, L.A. Okay. Go watch the All right. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May you receive your identity in him and nothing else. No one else. Don't resurrect your old nature. Be birthed into your new calling. God bless you guys. Have a powerful week.